Francisco, I got the line of credit for $25,000. I went now within- the Personal line or business? What's up, Dream Builder? Are you someone who's interested in creating a life by your design through all things real estate? Well, I can assure you, you are in the right place. Join me, your host, Casanova Brooks. I'm an award-winning real estate agent and investor as we uncover the top tips, strategies, and the mindset of the top real estate entrepreneurs across the world. Stay locked in because we're about to go on a journey that will change your life. This is the Ty Capital Millionaire Podcast. This is episode 130. My name is Charles Oglesby, also known as Todd Millionaire or Todd Billy or Legend Billy, whatever day of the week it is, founder and director of Ty Capital Investment Club, also Todd Acquisitions, also Ty Capital Cuts. I've been doing a lot of stuff over the last two years and plan to do a lot more. Make sure you leave us a rating, a review. We like five-star reviews. We like honest reviews. So um, help us get those out there. Um, that helps us move up in the rankings. We move up in the rankings as you guys rate and review. So we appreciate those. Thank you for tuning in. The purpose of this podcast is to share the stories of successful African-American business owners and investors because we believe business and investing are the true keys to financial success and generational wealth. Also, welcome to the show, co-host Rashana Scott. Can you say something for the people? Thanks for having me. Thanks for tuning in, guys. We have a very special guest for you today. A lot of our guests, we are, they have, they have phenomenal stories. So I'll just say that and I'll let them go ahead and introduce himself, Mr. Casanova Brooks. Yeah, well, I'll say thank you to the listeners and obviously thank you to both of you co-hosts for having me on here. I'm excited. I woke up this morning with the first thing on my mind that I had this conversation with you guys. So I'm ready to share. As far as my story, me and Rashana, I think where we first got connected is we're both from South Side of Chicago. Or she's a, are you from West Side? No, South Side. Are you from South Side as well? Okay. Uh, so that Chicago connection. So when I saw somebody like Rashana that was out there that had been a staple in the community, not only as investing, but just being a leader, that was where I first, you know, started to follow her and started to follow her movement. And for anybody who follows me pretty closely, they know that I do have a Dream Nation podcast. And Rashana blessed me with being one of the first guests to come on. And it didn't really take, you know, too much pleading or prying for her to come. So I was super grateful for that. But that's where our connection came in from. For me, I'm a young man, I would like to think, and I'm from Chicago, Southside, before being moved. And for me, I was always a big dreamer. As most inner city kids, since I grew up in Chicago, most inner city kids, I would say that you have a lot of dreams, but you don't have a lot of resources. I was raised in a single parent home, just like a lot of kids there. So I resonate with it. I always knew though that I was going to do something big. I was going to, you know, go out there and I was going to live a life by my design. And so that's where it kind of all started for me is understanding that if I wanted to really have the success that I believed that I was capable of having, I had to go out there. I had to get the information. I had to put myself in a good environment. That didn't mean that I had to leave Chicago at the time, but I was so young when I did leave. It wasn't my choice. I was about 13 years old. So it wasn't my choice, but I still had these dreams. I still had these goals and ambitions. And so for me, I always knew that I was going to, you know, be a business owner in, in one sense or another. And that's kind of where my journey started. I don't know where you guys want to take it or how much you want to go. I want it to be conversational. So I'll kind of let you guys lead it and anything that you want me to tap into more, I'm definitely more than, than open to do that. So I'm curious to know what the early attempts of manifesting that dream looked like for you. Because I mean, for me, people don't know this, but I've had multiple businesses. So I've had a car wash. I've had, of course, a shirt company. I've had a party promotion company. I've had a lot of businesses in my background. What do those early days, early teens, 18-year-old um, dreams look like? Yeah. So I, I would say going back to when I was about seven or eight, growing up, again, my mom, she always used probably even the analogy that I like to think of is robbing Peter to pay Paul. Right. So she was always, she was always working a job. So for me, I kind of had to get it on my own. Now I like to always make sure that I preface it by saying that I was never deprived of love and support. My mom always tried to give me whatever she could, but because she didn't have a college education, because she didn't own a business, she never owned a house or even a car, she didn't have a lot to give to me as far as resources. So for me, my first ever job that I remember, I was standing outside, this was on um, 78th and, and Yates, and there's a gas station over there. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and I, I would stand outside and people would come out and I would stand right in front of your car and I would ask if I could pump your gas. 
right? Some people would say, yeah, a lot of people would say, yeah, some people would say no, right? But it didn't really matter. It was the power of serving other people. So mm -hmm. then if you give me 50 cents or a dollar, I mean, back then this is in like 95. So that could go a long way because we did still have things like quarter candy at least. Uh -huh. Right. And, and I was getting a lot of what I wanted. So that was where it first off started with me. And I remember there were some days where I would come out and I would have 15 to $20 and I felt like I made it. I didn't have to ask for anything. Right. right. And so that was kind of where it started. Then when we fast forward on to those early teen days, I'll tell you in my journey, even leading up to now, I would say that I probably sold some of everything. If it wasn't crack or dope, right, I sold it. And, and, and that's keeping it 100. I mean, I sold Kirby vacuums. I sold shoes. I sold pills. I sold it all. Right. I, and besides those two, I mean, I sold knives everything and so again it was always just me looking for my opportunity and I knew like early on school was never a problem for me but I knew that it was always gonna it was always gonna I was gonna have a ceiling right it was always gonna hold me into some confines because it was always following the rules that everybody else laid for you right and I was always an outlier and, and what I wanted to do is I wanted to get out there and I wanted to really create my own path and so in the beginning, growing up in Chicago, or even when I got moved to Iowa in my early teen days, uh, everybody would always tell me for the most part, all right, and I, maybe the negative people, I just learned to tune out from an early age. But for the most part, I had people that was just like you two that would be like, yo, brother, if you keep doing what you're doing, you could be anything that you want to be. Uh -huh. So I appreciated that even at a young age, what well, the problem was, I never saw anybody who was doing anything that I wanted to do. Uh -huh. right? They was all living. It was kind of like that rich dad, poor dad. I had a lot of poor dads around me. Uh -huh. Right. And so I'm like, okay, that's cool. But none of you guys are doing anything that like, because for me, how I got a lot of my knowledge is I was always being exposed to something else. And so I'm an only child. So I didn't have any older brothers or sisters or, or big cousins that was doing anything that was on the right path or owned anything. Right. Nobody in my family was ever owning anything. So I was like, man, I would always turn on the TV and my favorite show growing up was VH1's The Fabulous Life Of. Yeah. It was like VH1's version of MTV Cribs. I like right? that show too. Yeah. Right. So, so they were show. The rich and famous. <laughs> with, right? the, with that lady host, what was her name? All of that. Who was, who was it on the lifestyle of the rich and the famous? I don't remember. I can't um, remember neither. But while we're having a, a thing break, I just want to <laughs> I want to point out that it's interesting that even as a uh, young child, even early on, you understood without taking an economics class, you understood um, the principles of supply and demand, right? Even with you saying like you sold everything, you understood that, okay, if the marketplace wanted shoes, you were going to bring them shoes and figure out how to buy low, sell high, and make a profit, you know, even if that profit was two dollars, right? Right. <laughs> right. And, and like you said, even, you know, knowing that there was a want or a need that you had, you know, whether it was, like you said, uh, you know, some candy from the candy store, some chips or some juice or whatever, having that need and, ha and having to feel that need, because I'm sure, um, I'm sure like you, you know, I grew up similar with parents who were like, okay, well, if you wanted something, I don't have. That was always the response, right? I don't have money for this. I don't have money for that. You don't have money for McDonald's. You don't have money for, you know, chips, candy at the corner store. Um, but I think, like I said, without you even taking any type of, you know, college curriculum classes to understand that, I think it's interesting that you, you saw that. I mean, you said seven and you were seven and eight. Right. Oh yeah, yeah. absolutely. And it was crazy. I think naturally us as kids, like we're born like entrepreneurs. We're born to negotiate, right? Mm -hmm. I got an eight-year-old boy right now, I'm a two-year-old daughter. My son, he, he's such a genius. And I like to, and obviously we all taught our kids, but I just watch. I believe that I'm, I'm pretty witty. I'm pretty smart. All, he, he just trumps me at every level. And you just mm -hmm. watch how smart he is and the things that he does even at eight. Prime example. So this was just, I believe, yesterday morning. So he's got this Lego table. He takes a lot of time in building these Legos. Well, my daughter will just go over there and wreck the whole Lego table. Like, she just don't know, but she's trying to play. So anyway, he's, he, he sees that she's going over to the Lego table. He's like, no, no, no. And then all of a sudden, they, now she just got to the point where she can get vitamins. So she has one of his little Finsulone Chewy vitamins. So what he does on the quick moment is he says, hey, have you had your vitamin yet? And she said, no. And he said, come over here. I'm going to make sure you get your vitamin." 
So then he gets her away from the Lego table and then he proceeds to just talk to her and for, and cause he has to put away at this time, he has to put away the, the dishes or whatever. So what was crazy about this was I just watched him manifest it. He kept her over there for about 20 minutes until he was done putting away all of the dishes. And then they both went back over to the Lego table together. Wow. So then he can make sure that he maneuvered how it was going to go down. But it was just, it, and when you watch it, you just watch kids every single day. So for me, it was just like what you were talking about. It's the want that I knew that I wanted something, but you got to think fast. Right, because if you allow yourself to just be like, oh, woe is me, then the world's gonna pass you by and you're never gonna get it. So yeah. that was what I think it was. It was out of instinct. And I think we all learned that from a kid. And, and as long as you have enough perseverance and know that like, I'm gonna get it by any means necessary, you're, you're, you're gonna be successful. And I think I just took on those traits. And obviously growing up in any inner city, right? A lot of us, we want, we want things, we see it. We know that we have a lot of potential. We know that a lot starts with us, within our culture, within our family, everything. So it's like, man, how can I get that? And then now it's about trying to figure out some legal ways to do it. And the fortunate part is growing up in today's age, there's so much information out there that you can get it better than you ever have or faster than you ever have. Absolutely. Yeah. So that was, that was kind of like my entrepreneurship in, in the beginning, but then I would say where it really took off for me was when, so when I, a, a huge part of my journey that I used to not tell a lot, but then it started to, to become, it is my truth. So I started to tell a little bit more, but when I was 15, I was diagnosed with stage four lymphoma cancer. So it was all throughout my body. Um, how I got diagnosed with it. Uh, basically, I was transitioning from football to basketball. I found myself a couple of days in the hallway. I couldn't breathe. And uh, that was huge for me because then I was like, okay, this is the first time that I'm really being challenged as, as a cancer patient to understand that life's not promised. Because when you're young and you're a kid, you think that, oh, I always got tomorrow. Yeah. So after I was diagnosed, I wound up going to the University of Iowa and I did 45 days in that hospital. Then when I got done with that, I had two years that I went through chemotherapy. And that really developed my perseverance, I would say. That, that developed my resilience for everything. And from there, because a lot of things I felt was taken from me, I really started to go after everything that I wanted. Right? It was no longer sitting back waiting for it to come to me. And I really started to look at, okay, I, there's one of the sayings that I always say, but I got it from Jay. And he says that everybody could tell you how to do it, but they've never done it. So then I really started to look at who are the people that I'm taking advice from. And I really started to look at, okay, if I'm 17 now, I'm in, you know, remission, how do I really go out here and live a life by my design? So that was where real true entrepreneurship came from. But the first thing I had to do was, was make sure that I get the education. And again, fortunate for having YouTube University, that kind of really started off for my economics path. Nice. That's dope. Yeah. Okay. So fast forward. Wow. So fast forward, you are in Nebraska now. Mm -hmm. You're in Nebraska. You are my husband, a father, a real estate agent, an investor, you know, I'm sure some other titles that I'm probably missing. So what, what was that transition like? Was it like, like you said, you knew you you went through, you know, what you went through and then you were like, Hey, what to, to live the life that I want to live, I got to go after it. I got to go and get it. So was real estate the very first venture into that career or was it, you know, a couple other, uh, paths, I guess in your early twenties before you went ahead and, um, started doing what you're doing now? No, a uh, great question. So it definitely wasn't. And it's, it's that try, try, try. And, and I'm fortunate because what it allowed me to know was I knew what I liked, but then more importantly, I knew what I didn't like. So I'll tell you how, you know, my path basically came about. So after, first off, I went to the University of Iowa for college, right? I did three years at the University of Iowa. Two months into my junior year, grades are fine. But at this time, I really started to pursue music. And I really became of the heart and soul that the belief, I should say, that just because you had a degree did not mean you were going to be successful in life, right? So that was big for me. So what that meant was, since I was really trying to pursue music at this time, me and my homeboy, I wound up calling up my mom and grandma after we had just gotten enrolled into all our classes, school is just starting. And I call them up and I'm like, hey, I don't think this is what I want to do anymore. And they're like, 
what? Like, first off, my mom's like, well, you got to tell your grandma because my grandma was more like my father figure, right? And so I'm like, oh my God, that's not what I want to do. So anyway, I wind up telling her and then my parents, as they always have done, when I say my parents, I say my mom and grandma, they supported me and they're like, okay, well, look, you come back home, you're going to get a job. Well, I wound up withdrawing from all of my classes, took all of the student loan money, took a Greyhound bus to go up to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where I got a cousin who was big in the indie scene. So imagine he was like more like a zero in, in Houston, right? Like he was that level. We had done songs with Boosie, Webby, all these people. So I remember calling him before we even withdrew from classes. Like, yo, listen to me and my mans. We got basically a mixtape. I want you to hear it. And at this time, MySpace was booming. So I gave him the website, um, my MySpace website. He listens to it. He comes, he calls me back like a day or two later. He's like, yo, like, I'm gonna be honest, y'all high. He was like, but the problem is your production is, is mm. He was like, you got to get into a real studio. We didn't have no real studio. Right. So then we withdrew all that money. Me and my homeboy, we took the Greyhound, went up to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. We recorded, uh, I, I want to say like four or five tracks in that professional studio. Then we went back to, to Sioux City, Iowa, where I was living at the time or, and where my parents had moved me to. And I started to, to really hustle. So what that meant along that journey, this was crazy because it was before drop, ship, sh drop shipping got big. But I wound up going to Alibaba and I found me a guy who, because we had a, a clothing line as well, and it was called G Fly and it stood for Grandeur Fly. And I still got the shirts, the hats, everything downstairs in my basement now. But I wound up finding a manufacturer for that and he made the shirts or whatever. I wound up borrowing from my buddy who was military at the time. He gave me like $350 and then I was going to pay him back as we sold the shirts. So I got all these shirts and, uh, and then I was going to basically sell them out of the trunk of the car because I knew Luda did it and other people were selling their demos, their mixtapes. Mm -hmm. So that was the path that I was going to go on. And then we got back and, and basically life starts to happen to you at that point, right? I got to get real job, things like that. And my homeboy, he's doing his own thing. So it's like, all right, whatever. So we basically wound up going our separate ways. I keep the clothing. I at least make enough money to pay my homeboy back who it gave me the $350. And then from there, I, d I got my first real job, I would say, and that was serving tables at a restaurant. It was like a mid-level restaurant, right? Not too high and not too low. And from there is where my mindset really started to shift. So what do I mean by that? It was, I really understood the power of serving other people because you two, you would come into my restaurant, this restaurant that I was working at on a Thursday night or even a Saturday night, it doesn't really matter. And I would say, Hey, Ms. Roshana, how are you doing? Just making small talk. You're like, I'm good. I'm like, Oh, cool. I'm like, y'all waiting on a table and you in there with your family, your friends You're like, yeah, actually we waiting on that table in your section. And after a while, and I started to get so many regulars and it started to dawn on me quickly that, yo, she, you know, Todd, Charles, he could have went anywhere in the city. But more importantly, he came to this restaurant that I was working at. And even crazier than that, he chose to wait in a, in a time where we got instant gratification. We all want it now. He chose to wait on the table in my section because he knew that I was going to serve him because she knew that I was going to take care of her. So that was big for my mindset. And I'm like, oh, okay. So now I'm serving tables. Everything's good. Son's just born. He's about one years old. Well, I'd had a GM of a pretty big car dealership in Sioux City. I'd had him and his family in my table a couple of times and they became like regulars. So now I go in to buy my first car. It's like a little Kia Forte. And I'm buying it from my homeboy. And he, he comes back to the table and he's like, yo, you know, Justin, Justin's the GM. And I'm like, yeah. He's like, he wants to know if you got any interest in selling cars. And I look at, at Julie, she's sitting right next to me. And I'm like, nah, because all I knew was you sleazy car sales. Right. I know my parents never owned a car. I don't know how to drive a stick, nothing. So I'm like, nah, I'm good on that. Was well, all sales managers are, he was real persistent. So he wound up getting me in there and he like, he's like, yo, what's your goals? And I'm like, man, to be honest with you, all I know is I want to make six figures. I want to make a hundred thousand in a calendar year. He's like, well, how much did you make at the restaurant last year? I'm like, well, man, I made about like 45,000. I was one of the top servers, but I was getting cash tips. So I didn't have to claim none of that. I could pick up, drop uh, shifts whenever I wanted to. So I felt like I was doing good. He like, yo, you see these three guys outside of my glass office? I look back and I see him. He like, all three of those guys made over 90 grand last year, two of which made over 110. The only guy who didn't, he was a year younger than me, just went to a different high school, but we knew of each other. So now he's hit my hot buttons, right? right? Now I'm like, okay. So That's he's like, <laughs> right? So he, so he like, yo, I'm not saying you're going to come in and make a, a hundred grand. He's like, but I know potential when I see it. So long story short, he got me to come to, to selling cars. Within six months, I got car salesman of the month 
two months in a row, just came off my first 10K month. So now it's like, okay, things are changing for me. Like I could see it. Well, around the same time, I get recruited to go do network marketing Amway, right? And it was by my seventh grade football coach. And so it, how they got me and, and really what I quickly learned was that that network marketing Amway was not for me, but the values and the personal development that I got right. exposed to was crazy, right? And it was the first time I got exposed to richest man in Babylon, go for no, rich dad, poor dad, all of these things. So I'm like, yo. So what that taught me really as I'm selling cars was that I was trading my time for money. Mm. I couldn't sell a car if I wasn't at the dealership. Right. So I'm like, okay, so I see where this is going. I got to get up out of here. So then they had a big congregation down here in Omaha where they was always meeting at. And they like, yo, Casanova, you got to get up out of selling cars. Come down here. We'll help you get a nine to five job where you can get a lot of your time off. And then when you're not working at that nine to five, you'll build your business. So I'm like, all right, cool. So then I wound up taking a job. I was told that it was supposed to take like two to three weeks before I got hired. I got hired on the spot. About 72 hours later, they flew me down to Dallas, Texas, where I was going to do the training. And keep in mind, we still live back in, in Sioux City. So my, my friends moved my wife and my son down here to Omaha while I'm in Dallas, Texas doing this training. And, and we got no family, no friends, no nothing down here. We're just going to make it work, right? So I did that within nine months. This was inside sales of being a digital marketing consultant for a company called Dex. You might know Dex. Uh, it's like the telephone directory, DEX. Yellow Pages, Dex. Yeah. You probably know. I mean, they're all over the country. So I did that. Now, Dex hired me on because they were losing so many customers out of the Yellow Pages that they were trying to figure out how they can bundle them a website and keep their, their customers on. So within nine months, I wanted to finish the number eight in the entire company doing that. And then what that taught me, though, working in the corporate space is that everybody could tell you no, but nobody could tell you yes. Right. So they had me leading all these emerging leader programs, all these other things. But I'm like, yo, I'm, I made more money than all these uh, these managers and directors. Like, yo, I, I want to try my hand at management. They're like, ah, casting over. We don't we don't have that position open right now. But just keep doing what. So I'm like, ah, I see where this is going. But around that same time, I get exposed. You two, I get exposed to Jay Morrison. Right. I missed the real estate. So I, I wound up catching somehow I wound up catching one of his YouTube videos because friends of ours had just bought a house here in Omaha. And then the gal's like, Hey, you'd be great at real estate. You should try it. And my wife's like, Julie, she's like, yo, like I, he talks about real estate. I tell him all the time, but he never listens to me. And I'm like, but that's not it. I just, I don't know nothing about real estate. Like you want me to just go full to Turkey co commission. And so anyway, she like, I'm like, nah, I'm good. A couple of days later, she like, yo, you gotta, you gotta really just go talk to some agents. You gotta do something. Cause otherwise you are always going to be wondering what if. So I think during that process, I started looking at YouTube and I came across Jay Morrison, three-time felon, all of that, right? And Mr. Real Estate Celebrity Realtor. He had said something that at that time resonated with me. And he had said, um, you got to figure out a way to be the Lord of your land because he or she who owns the land makes the rules. And I was like, yo, well, shit, how am I going to figure out how to be the Lord of my land? Well, I looked at his trajectory and he had started out and he was a celebrity realtor. Right. So I was like, yo, I don't know nothing about owning real estate, but I do know how to help people basically build relationships, help people buy, sell and invest in the real estate. And then I'll use my commissions, build relationships both in the business and outside. And uh, that's how I start to own and be the Lord of my land. So that's how real estate came into play. My whole goal was to always be an investor and own the real estate rather than getting my license. Right. A lot of, a lot of quality in there. Yeah. I try to make it as condensed as possible as I, as I could. What, I mean, there's a lot of good principles in there. One of them that I liked a lot was just the service aspect. And one of the things I'd kind of tell people is like, if you're trying to start a business with no money, just get into the service industry and you can get out there, you can help people, you can serve people. And the crazy part about it is it's like a biblical principle. Like service is really big in the Bible. And they always talk about like blessings follow service and never realize like maybe the blessings can follow your business as your business serves more and more and more and more people then you're more blessed. The other thing that I liked about that is that you have to dominate where you are. And as you were dominating where you are, it opened up doors for other opportunities. And so a lot of really strong principles in there. Unfortunately, my audio went out for that last little snippet from the beginning of where you started talking about Jay Morrison to where you kind of ended. So I didn't get a chance to really hear that part, but Roshana heard it. So can you ask him a question that kind of stems from that? Okay. So... <laughs> What's cool so is that 
Yeah, I'll tell it, you the last snippet. So maybe we can, you know, but Jay had talked about being the Lord of your land. Right. right. And that was where it was huge for me because I didn't know anything about owning real estate. I, I didn't even know how, how big real estate was. So as I watched his trajectory, that was, that was kind of where real estate f- fell into place for me. Cause I wanted to figure out ways that I could be the Lord of my land. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So as you took on this principle of like say being the Lord of your land, what did your very first investment look like? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Great question. So my very first one, I just gotten me a line of credit and basically I got the line of credit for $25,000. I went now within the personal line or business. This was a business line of credit. So how I even got this, this was coming at the end of my first year in real estate. So to give somebody a little bit of perspective on, on what my mindset was like and how I got that line of credit. Basically, my first year in real estate, I did 46 deals, $8 million in volume, just nine months after losing my mom, my job, and my home, all within a week and a half time span, right? And I told you, I was very close to my mom. My mom passed away of cancer. This, it, was, it was a big, big deal challenge for me. So what had happened was I, I then take out in the gates, I take off in, in real estate, and it, in, I wanted to bring that part up because you talk about dominating your space wherever you are. Right. And that's a real big deal because for me, being in a brand new city, no friend, no family, no friends, no church group, I didn't know. And and anybody who knows Nebraska or even Omaha, Nebraska, while to, to let people know there are black people in, in Omaha and in Nebraska, but it's it's being honest with you, it's definitely dominated by old money, by old principles. Right. We have not started to to really become forward thinking, not as we want to. So for me, I looked at it not as a, a crutch to say, oh, my God, I can't be successful here because very few that look like me are. I looked at it as an opportunity to okay. say that there was somebody that's done it before. And if even if not, I know that I can do it. So I bet on myself. So. I like it. After I did this, I was starting to really make a name for myself, obviously doing these 46 deals in my first year in real estate. And then I had a couple mentors um, along the way that was at least educating me on why it's so powerful to own real estate and what the market looks like here in Omaha. So one of which, he was kind of like my Mr. Miyagi, but he connected me with his private banker. So I'd already sat down with three or four private bankers prior, and I could tell that they just weren't really taking me seriously. Right. I mean, young kid, I, I didn't have a proven system that they like to see your track record, but I did have a lot of energy and I'm like, yo, I, I want to own some property. So he connected me with his, which that bridged the gap for me. Right. Like that was everything. And so she sits down with me and she says, okay, Casanova, well, what type of assets do you got? I'm like, well, I ain't got no assets. She's like, okay, well, um, you got a 401k a retirement. I don't have any of that, but I did have a car. I had that Kia Forte, which I told you about. Now that Kia Forte was worth about $8,000 at the time. And then we also had another car, GMC Terrain, which I owed about 18 grand on it, right? And so she basically told me, she said, listen, I'll tell you something. If you can pay off both of these cars, you come back to me with these pink slips, I'll see what I can do about getting you a line of credit. Now, I don't think she really thought that I was going to do it, but because I was really having these commission checks, boom, within the next 45 days, I paid off that other car, came right back to her. I said, what's up? Gave her, I had the pink slips. She then was like, okay, well, let, let me see what I can do. I'm like, okay, see what you can right. do. <laughs> right? And I'm like, yo, let's do it. So she came back, she, she upheld her in and she said, yo, here's 25,000. So I had 25,000. I instantly go to the MLS because I got access. I mean, even if you didn't, if you weren't a real estate agent, don't think that you can't contact a real estate agent and say, listen, I just got this line of credit. I'm trying to make some shape. So I went to the MLS, found a property. This property was listed for $30,000. It was a three bedroom, one bath, right around Creighton University. If you, if you all know the Midwest or Omaha, it's a big university. So Nobody I wanted to- Omaha. What's up? I said, nobody <laughs> knows Omaha. <laughs> just, just you. <laughs> Listen, you know Belly? You know Belly, the movie? Yes. Right, Omaha, right? You know, you know Bud Crawford, the boxer? Mm-hmm. Gotcha. You know Warren Buffett? Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, no Warren Buffett. <laughs> you know Warren Buffett, so you know Omaha. But yeah, so basically, I wound up getting a, a house. It was listed for thirty thousand. I uh, instantly I wanted to offer him about thirty because it was originally on the market for forty thousand. But it came back on the market after like thirty days. So I called up the listing agent, and and she just happened to be at my brokerage as well. I'm like, yo, tell me about. It. She like, you know what? The sellers are just tired. 
you know, they want to get out of this property. They want to move back to California to be with their family. So I'm like, boom, I could just offer them 30,000. But then I knew that if I offered them or, or if I offered them, I needed to offer them lower than that because I needed to have some money for the renovations. Cause keep in mind, I didn't have no money. So I needed to offer them lower than that. So long story short, I wound up offering them uh, $22,000 for this property. There's nothing wrong with it. It's owner occupied everything. So then they wind up accepting the 23, the 22,000 to make a long story short. So I'm feeling great. I go back to like my Mr. Miyagi and I'm like, yo, they just accepted the 22,000. He looks at it. He's like, oh, you paid too much. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, it's, I don't have to do nothing to it. It's moving ready right now. And he's like, you paid too much. So now I'm like, man, well, then I wound up finding a trick out that was like, yo, while I'm in that due diligence process, if I go back and be like, yo, I would like a price reduction because I bought it as is. Right. So I, I wasn't going to ask them to do anything, but I was like, yo, there's still some things that scare me. I would like a price reduction. So the other agent, she's like, well, how much you think? Now I know that they paid, uh, they paid, I want to say it was 25 at this time they paid for it. So I couldn't go like 15 or otherwise I felt that they was going to tell me to kick rocks. Right. So I was going off of my gut a little bit. So I was like, all right, well, I, I, let me get 18,000 thinking that if they said no, we can meet in the middle at 20,000. And then I would still have 2000 towards my renovations. So then she comes back a couple hours later. She's like, deal at 18,000. I'm like, what? Boom. Mm -hmm. So then I get that 18,000. I put $6,000 into it using a contractor. I didn't do none of the work myself. So I'm all in for 24,000, right? Then find renters. But first off, I flipped a mortgage on it. So after we closed on it, I needed to free up my line of credit. So I flipped a mortgage on it, right? I, I was all in for the 24,000 put the mortgage on it. My, my mortgage payment on it was, I think around like $297. Then we go to rent it out. How much do you think I rented for? Seven. $800. 945. Wow. Right. So it was boom. But then I also do a internal evaluation on it, which you, that's like the bank's smaller form of an appraisal, not getting a full third party appraisal. How much do you think it comes out for? 75. I wish at the time it's more than 75 now, but at the time it was 65, right? Which was huge though, because what? I didn't use any of my own money. Instant yeah. equity. Instant equity. So I created $41,000 in equity and I was cash flowing, right? Around like $600 a month, which is great. We still own that property right now. So that was four years ago and, and it's been great. We keep it. Now I'll rent that out in 975 and we did a, a third party evaluation on it again. And now it came out at 95,000. Wow. So it, it, it's good. So that was how my first property went down. And I basically used the Burr method, right? Because that allowed me to leverage. Then I did a flip after that. Then I bought more property. So it, it was good. Right. So you did, man, what's really cool about, well, what I was going to say is that when you buy a property from somebody, yeah, they pay 25,000, but they've likely paid down the mortgage substantially. And so to value your offer at what you think they owe might actually not be getting you the best deal, even though it worked out for you in the end, like you probably could have offered even lower. They probably didn't have any money in the deal at all. They probably just wanted to walk away. You could probably get to pay like 10, whatever for it. Right. But the, what's really cool about your, well, can you talk about this? Because we've had people on the show who that first deal kind of set them up to do everything. So you, went from no money to 40 grand in equity. Where did you go from there? Yeah, so from there, we, it, we was hooked on it. So basically I, was, I set up, me being a real estate agent, I could set up my wife and I on automatic searches. Mm -hmm. So I knew what I was looking for and I wanted to be in the opportunity zone areas, right? Because for me, one thing I learned early on, two principles. One, you fall in love with the deal, not with the property. Right. So many people, they look at a property and they're like, oh, this is a three bedroom too. But the deal's not really that good. And the right. second, the second principle was, is cash flow was everything. Right. And it didn't matter even if the market crashed again the day after I bought my property, if I didn't need to sell that day. I could right. hold on to it because over time we know that real estate and land will always appreciate over time. So that was my big thing. I always wanted to make sure that I was investing for cash flow and the appreciation was just on top. And that was just a principle that I learned. Mm -hmm. So then as, as I sat with my wife and I up on these automatic searches, she obviously was hooked at it because she's seen the, the equity that we had gained and everything. So then she hit me up one day and was like, Hey, did you see this property? that just came on the market. This is like eight, eight thirty in the morning. She got the email 
and I ran over there. I looked at the property and, um, and then I wound up seeing the neighbor just happened to be leaving to go to work. Now this property at the time was listed for around $60,000 and this neighbor just happens to be going to work. So I'm instantly always looking at how much can I rent it out for? Right. Because I got my commissions that's doing all the legwork for me to pay my bills. So for me, I'm only looking for cash flow and how much can I rent it out for long term? So the neighbor comes out and I'm like, hey, can I ask you, like, you, you rent this property? You're like, nah, I actually own. I'm like, oh, okay, well, how much did you buy for? He's like, I just bought this. This was around, I want to say like, I want to say this was in like August. Don't quote me on that. But it was in the same year. And he had just bought, I know for sure, in January. Because I went and looked it up on a county assessor. And I seen that he bought, it was the exact same house. He bought his for $93,000, mm-hmm. right? And I was like, oh, okay. So I'm instantly seeing $33,000 in equity, right? But that's uh, dependent on how much I got to put into it. Da, 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 da. So I'm like, oh, okay. And he's like, and I don't really know about the rental rates because most of the people on this block own. Mm. Like, oh, okay. So now <laughs> I know I'm on the street. So everything's working out. I'm like, okay, this is good. So then I go in there and I look at the property. And, and I mean, instantly, I didn't, nothing wrong with the foundation. Um, the roof was good. I didn't have to put a new furnace in. There were, there were some minor things, but it, it was just, it was a great deal. So I wound up buying that. But more importantly, I wound up negotiating that deal down to $48,000 is how much I got it for. And I found out that they was going through, basically the mom owned it, but the mom had passed away. So it was like a, a probate. And things like that. So I wound up getting that deal for forty eight thousand. I want to say I wound up putting in around like thirty thousand dollars, thirty to thirty five. I wound up putting in. This was three years ago. So I wound up putting in thirty to thirty five thousand. But then I had the buyer myself, and I wound up selling the deal at one hundred and twenty thousand. So I paid no commission. Right. I was all in for. I want to say around like. $80,000 and then I wound up selling it for that. So that was my first flip, but I used all the money or I basically used leverage the equity in my other property to then, you know, have this money for the flip and the trade lines and things like that, which then set me up again. And then we went, wound up going to buy another property, which was a buy and hold, which was- It becomes a snowball. One yeah. of the things that I'm hearing in your story and something I've kind of taken from Roshana and from a guest that I've had on here recently, is having your real estate license does help you become a better investor. Oh, you I, got a, you, I got a couple of questions. Um, what are your couple of questions? So how did you, so you didn't mention having any type of, like we, we know you're a natural born hustler, right? We got that. But what you didn't mention was oh. having any type of renovation experience or anything like that. How did you find your contractors and how were you okay with like trusting that they would do good work and things like that? Because for a lot of people, that's one of the reasons why they don't get started, right? They're afraid of the whole working with contractors and things like that. And then the next thing is, I want to know exactly how did you finance that next deal? Like you mentioned, you know, using the equity from the other property, but what you use that as like a down payment or like, what was the exact structure there? And then, and then the contractor. Yeah, absolutely. Great question. So I'll be honest, everything that I do, I I operate off of a ready fire aim approach. Right. And, and because I just, so every, that was, that was big for me when I started to go with it. I knew that the longer it's just like anything, the longer that you wait on, on trying to analyze everything, the more that you'll talk yourself out of it. Right. So for me, I didn't have the experience. How I got those contractors is there was another agent. I told you I had a couple investors. They weren't partnering with me. They didn't get any of my deals or anything like that, but or not investors. I had a couple mentors, right? So the, like I had the one old guy, he owned 76 units here in Omaha. And then I had another cat who he owned, I want to say somewhere around like 115 between him and his brother. But it was the same thing. I wanted to get as much knowledge as I could from them, but I also knew that they had no financial interest in me. And I was very brand new to the world of mentorship and coaching and everything like that. So I wanted to ask enough, but I didn't want to make it feel like that I was being too needy, right? Mm-hmm. To where they're like, bro, you ain't giving me none of your deal. Like da da da. So I would, I, and I just got very blessed and, and maybe it's because they knew that my heart was in the right place that like mm-hmm. how I got these contractors to answer your question is one of my, the second mentor, he's younger, but him and his brother, 150 units. I just reached out to him and was like, Hey, I'm looking for some contractors. I got this property. Now he's Hispanic, right? And he got a whole bunch of Hispanic, like all of his people. So he actually sent <laughs> me a list of like 15, 20 contractors. 
And he'd wow. like, just go down the list, just right. Come, right? And so for me, not being afraid and being a, a you know, a, a people person, I, rent, I went down the list and I just called a couple of them, right? Same way I've done with everything, like, boom, I'm just gonna call. And so as I talked to them about it, my, my big thing, it's the same way you build a company, same way you build a team, same way you become a leader, is I wasn't pitching off of the one deal, right? And I, this is still the way that I operate. I'm never pitching off of the one deal. I'm always pitching off of the long term. Mm -hmm. So when I went to those contractors, I was like, listen, like, here's what I'm looking to do. If you do right by me, here's what it's going to look like long term for us, right? Mm -hmm. Did I really know what the long term? No, but I right. knew that I got a vision. And as long as, you know, we keep this all kosher, you're going to eat, I'm going to eat, right. I'm going to go get me some apartment buildings, I'm going to make sure that we all good. And I think that maybe they could hear the compassion in my voice, they could hear the, the conviction, because that was all real. I always operate off of integrity, mm -hmm. right? So th that's why, and I use those same contractors to this day, right, on the deal. I just, you guys will see it later on on my, on my Facebook, but I just got a property, I got this property back in what this was six months ago. So I got it. We closed on it at the end of May and I bought this property for 91,000. I put 17.5 all in on it. Right. And then we just closed on it last Tuesday, we closed on it last Tuesday and I closed on it for 159.9, no partners. Wow. Right now, this was the first time. And Rashana, this is, this is crazy because remember I called you four or five months ago and I asked you about what? Partner private money this mm -hmm. is the first ever deal that i did with private money hey. off of our conversation i used hey. to, I, <laughs> me. remember i was asking like yo the eight percent is it like flat fee all that right and again i didn't know how rishana would respond to it i just reached out my heart's in a good place i'm like yo i i, I want to make this work she gave me her best of advice right and, and 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 i did that with two or three other people and i just at the end i had to take some action so right. there's a the, the guy who was a past client of mine. I know he got super deep pockets. I made sure all my money, my, my numbers was lined up. Mm -hmm. I gave him the comps, everything. He said, you know what, Casanova, I'm going to do this with you based off of the long term. Because he already got his money tied up in a whole bunch of venture capitalist stuff and ag stuff and all this other stuff. But he gave it to me on 8%, right? Mm -hmm. And it wasn't flat fee. It was 8% annual. Mm -hmm. I only used the money for five months. So I felt like I got blessed because he could have just, you know, and he put up the, the, the 91,000, right. I paid his attorney fees, things like that. And then I had trade lines at Lowe's and, and Sherwin Williams and things yeah. like that. So my negotiation with him on this is you put up the, the, that money, I'm going to make sure I put up the rehab costs and I'm going to prove my worth to you. Right. Everything went smooth. 159.9, which is what I thought originally when I told him, like on my number sheet, I thought that I was going to sell it for 150,000. But because of how much the work that I put in on it, I was like, nah, I think I could get like 160 out of it. Put it up. We sat on the market for about a week and a half. Boom, got it in there. I did pay some closing costs, but I didn't have to pay a listing commission, of course. Right. And it all worked out. So I closed on that last Tuesday. Nice. But again, just getting out there, trying to get some information that I didn't know about. And the last question that you asked is, how did I finance those deals? How did I know about it? So I had the line of credit, right? Then mm -hmm. I left all the money in. So I wasn't doing cash out refis. I was okay. leaving the equity in my properties. But then I had my banker. So I was always communicating with my private banker, who's still my private banker, saying, here's what I'm looking to accomplish. Right. You got to be honest, one with yourself, but you also got to be honest with your team. It's like a financial advisor. If you go in there and you're trying to hide money away, they can't truly help you. Right. right. Because banks are in the business of what? Loaning money. Right. And, and this is something I learned from Cashflow Quadrant. For every dollar that they bring in, they're able to loan out $10. Yep. Right. And I was like, oh, my God. So I know that she wants to loan money. The more, the bigger the loan that she can give off. So I told her I'd go back to it and say, hey, here's a property right here. Here's what the, the ARV is on the property. I haven't decided if I'm going to flip it yet or if I'm going to, you know, hold it yet. My big thing is I want to know how much can I cash flow. I'm thinking, right, that, that this property should, based off of these numbers, I'm thinking I should be able to rent this out at about $950. So based off of that, if I work my numbers backwards, if this property is listed at 50000 and I can go get it for thirty five, I don't know yet, but I just want to know if I can get it for thirty five, and I'm thinking I probably have to put somewhere around twenty twenty five into it. I'm in for sixty. What does that look like? And then she will work the numbers backwards for me. And so that was how all my financing, and it's all about robbing Peter to pay Paul. And, and I'm looking at what she's sending me back in the email. 
and I'm going over it. And then I'm talking to my wife. My, that's my only partner in all this. I've never had a partner. So that was kind of how it all went for me as far as the financing. Love yeah. it. Relationships. I'm sorry. Now we can get back to Charles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, great questions, though. I, I love it. I, I want to be as transparent I had to as ask, possible. But I was going to forget. <laughs> yeah. Great question. Real estate and uh, real estate being a real estate agent, can you talk yeah. about how that's impacted your investing career? Yeah, so what it's allowed is, I think at the end of the day, we always wanna make sure that we got multiple tools in our tool bag, right? And so being a real estate agent, what it's allowed is for me to have a little bit more stuff, substance and leverage, or leverage to be able to go at not only an investor, not, but also at a banker. Right. Because I can come to a banker and say, listen, I have investors. I am an investor. Right. And, and I can be able to make sure I can put more food on your plate as well. Even if I'm in a, a, a period that I'm not buying anything. But that's I got dope. these clients that trust me. And now who knows where it leads to. Yeah. So that's the thing that I love about it, um, about being a real estate agent. And it gets you into a lot of doors. Right. We want to try to get in as many doors as possible. And at some points, I might not be able to get into the door with all the, the, the real estate investors because they got their chest out, right? Yeah. We already own this. What can he teach me as an investor? But I can get into the door to say, listen, I got this license right here. I can save you some money on your commission, right? And, and things like that because you're going to have to pay somebody. Plus, I got the market analysis for you. I can mm -hmm. take something off of your plate. I'm not trying to, you know... Um, basically take out food out of your mouth i'm trying to make sure that we can put more food on your plate if that makes sense so 100%. that's what i i've loved is that it's allowed me to be able to get into many doors however i decide i want to get in um yeah. what i learned is that it adds an extra layer of security like a sense of security especially working with private lenders right they love the fact that um you know you're going to put their money to work so not only are you the investor uh, where you're or the deal engineer right where you're putting things together and making it happen but then you also have this additional license or like a degree or whatever that can secure exactly what you're doing you know you're out working with buyers every single day and you know what it is that they like so you're able to bring that exact product to market you know you know what's sitting on the market in less than two weeks or less yeah. than a week, you know and and i they love to hear that like that. yeah yeah because because that's the thing you're out with buyers you are walking through probably like when i walk through my own rehabs and i see like a nick in the wall we got to fix that because i know as a buyer they're gonna say oh well they left that nick in the wall what else are they trying to hide you know and, it's, right. and to be honest you like it's a nick in the wall it's not that big of a deal it's just chip paint but a buyer is gonna say what else are they trying to hide versus oh, this is beautiful, this is immaculate, this is the house for me. That's what you want at the end of the day, especially when you're going in and flipping properties. You want people to walk in and you want those certain wow factors that are going to stand out to them, you know, that we know kitchens are bad. Like, I know how I, I've walked through many houses that have been completely redone. Well, the rehabs are terrible. And it's mm -hmm. like, no offense, I'm like, a, a man did this, right? <laughs> but not just... But not just a man, but a man who doesn't who doesn't have any knowledge of the market, right? You have to know what people like and what's selling, and you know. That makes you sense. One hundred percent. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and and the other thing that I would add to that is just like she said, you want to be able to know what's on the market, how long has it been on the market and understand the backside of that. But we all want leverage in life and we all want to feel like that we get a deal. Now, for a lot of people, when you talk about investing, the number one thing is going to come up is the stock market, right? But you can't get any insider information on the stock market, right? Because right. that's illegal. But in real estate, if I know that a deal is coming up, if I know that it's probate, if I know that they just want to get, you can get all of the insider information. So when you go to a private lender or a private investor and you got those other things that they might not be able to get other way and it's perfectly right. legal bargain, they love you for that. They like, oh, okay, because now I know. That's why I work with Miss Scott is because I know she knows all the things that's about to come to the market. So now I don't even got to compete. So now everybody's winning. Now you feel like your team is 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 a plus, and so yeah. you re so that's having a license as well. People start to tell you those things. Hey, my 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 aunt. That's how I got this property for the ninety one thousand. It was a financial advisor who's trying to get my business right, and and I love her, and she will get my business. But she reached out to me and she was like, hey, I got these clients. This guy's looking to sell his property. I wanted to see if you can meet with them about listing it. 
So I, then I go meet with them about listing it and I see this super dated. You guys will see it in the pictures, but it's super dated. What'd you say? <laughs> You're like, I'm keeping this one. Oh yeah, absolutely. And so I, so I disclosed, yeah. obviously I knew that I was an agent. Yeah, but I was like, listen, we got two options. One, we can list it as is. We can put it on the market, but here's about what you're going to get for it. Plus, most likely an investor is probably going to be the one who comes and buy it. So you know that they're probably not giving you full price on it. Just being completely honest. And then I said, or number two is I can buy this from you, right? You don't have to pay a commission, this and that, this and that. I gave them a couple of days to think about it. They called me back the very next morning. The daughter was like, hey, my dad wants to take you up on the offer for you to buy it. Boom. And that was how it went. Or number three, this might be an area where you have a lot of FHA buyers in, right? So if that was FHA number three too. comes out, if an FHA appraiser comes out, they're going to say, okay, well, in order for this to pass FHA inspection, you got to fix this, 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 and this. And guess what, Mr. Seller? Not only are you going to have to fix these repairs, they might want to negotiate a credit. You're going to have to pay closing costs. You're going to have to pay a realtor fee. You might as well just accept this lower offer and sell it to me. Sell it to me. And it, and it all worked out. And, and he loved it. And, uh, and it was all good. So as long as you disclose on the beginning, right, I, I love it. I love having an, a license and I couldn't see myself letting it go. Um, because just like you said, you add another layer of security and you just get in a lot more doors. Yeah. So in every job you've been in, you've been a high achiever. Can you talk about how you've been able to do that? Maybe some principles that you live by that allow you to achieve at that level? Yeah, absolutely. So I'd say the number one thing is I'm always willing to one, be exposed, but two, bet on me. So what, what do I mean by one, be exposed? I think when we first get into any, we fear what we don't know, right? It's just human nature. If we don't know it, we absolutely fear it. So for me, I've, I've just been so blessed to always have an open mind. If you call me about doing something, I'm always going to listen to the opportunity. And especially for us as, as you know, African-Americans, black people, we got to be more open minded because a lot of the times we lose out on the opportunity costs more than we lose out on the failure or the money that we spent and things like that. It's true. Right. It, it, it's so big. So for me, I, when I go into something, I'm always looking at the upside of if it went right. Right. Yeah. Rather than trying to look at, because I know what it's like to take L's. Like I said, I lost next to my wife, right? I lost the greatest person, you know, and, and my grandma who's still alive. Thank God. But I've lost the, my number one cheerleader. My mom, I was very close to her. So I know what it's like to experience pain, two years of chemo, all that. But what I don't know, and I think early on, I'd be super, the, the, the number one thing that I want to do in this world right now is I want to meet Jade. Right. And it's going to happen in the next yeah. two years. Watch what I tell you. It will happen. We watched this brother, right, go from a hundred thousand dollars to a billion dollars, right, for his worth and his valuation in 20 years, right, of where he came from. We saw it. So for me, I always looked at that opportunity to be like, listen, it doesn't matter if I'm selling digital ads, it doesn't matter if I'm selling cars. People don't buy what you do. They buy why you do it, right? And that's really what it is. Like once you start telling people, because as being a real estate agent, like it's no different than selling cars or whatever else, right? But people are going to buy me. People are going to buy why I'm doing what I'm doing. Philanthropy has always been huge. And you wonder why the people with the most money retain that money because they give away the most money as well. Right. People, they, they're always and given the time. Right. Rashana, she's been so successful. But look at how her brand has taken off over these last couple of years because she's not set back in the corner. Right. She's now traveling. You see her in Miami. You see her in Denver. You see her in all these places. Right. And, and she's just given. So for me, it was always looking at what the opportunity looks like. And once I made it, I didn't get stingy because this is a story that we tell ourselves, especially as black people. It's like if I never had it. I ain't never got, like, nobody ever gave me nothing. So when I get it, I ain't giving nobody nothing. Yeah. That's not the mindset that you got to have. So I think, yeah. again, the exposure and, and the willingness to look at the opportunity rather than just looking at the fear of what happens if I fail. It's like, yeah, but what happens if I succeed? Right. Right. I love it. That's so true. A lot of people, they talk themselves out of the opportunity. They didn't actually take it and lose. Man. Everybody can, everybody can tell you how to do it, man. But they've never done it. And that's, it's so big, right? And you see the shirt, like, evolved. We have to evolve. And, and, you know, obviously, another big thing and what I'm so proud of is, yes, I've had a trajectory of always betting on myself. But one of my 
thus far one of my biggest accomplishments aside from my kids is being able to really have an open mind to support my wife. So I'll tell you again, just always being transparent. We went through first off with both of our kids. We it took us two years to have them without um, going into too deep into it, right? Two years to have both of our kids, but they both came naturally. We looked at adoption. We looked at at everything, right? And then basically we went through a time about what was this six months ago, seven months ago, where um, basically without it being my wife's choice, we're no longer able to have children, right? She went through a surgery. We're no longer able to have children. Now, obviously for any woman, this becomes a very devastating factor when it's no longer your choice, right? And, and so the number one thing when she came to me, I, I felt for it. And, and obviously I've always been her biggest cheerleader because she's always been my biggest cheerleader. But the, one, the first thing that I told her was to understand that, you know, some people can't even have one child. Right. Mm-hmm. And for us, we were able to have two naturally. On top of that, I got a son who's eight, who's, who's so gifted and brilliant and, and loves sports and everything. And I'll, I get to live vicariously, at least for a little bit through him. And now a daughter who, same thing, she's uh, absolutely amazing. But then m- my wife, a- as she's going through this, we had been looking for about a year, year and a half at a, a, a daycare, but it was a losing daycare center. Now she had owned a daycare about, you know, Eight, probably about 10 years ago, she had owned an in-home daycare. But when you start out and you're dealing with friends, right? Now, all of a sudden, when it's time for them to pay their daycare bill, they're like, oh, my check wasn't enough. So yeah. I, it's like, wait, wait, wait. This is not the way this works. Like, we're real business here. So she got out of that real quick. But she never lost her passion or love for it. She comes from a big family, adoption, all those things. So then, after the surgery comes about two weeks into it, I go to pick up my daughter from the daycare center that she's go- she's going to. And the, the owner comes up to me. She says, hey, you're Jada's dad. Just want to let you know we're actually going to be closing down this center. We got two other locations. We're going to be closing this one down. So I'm like, okay. So I go home, tell Julie, and instantly it's a, you think of what I'm thinking, right? And so it's like, uh uh-oh. So long story short, speed this up. Now we we got that daycare about a month after that exact daycare. We didn't buy it from her because she closed down that center, right? But we started up from there. And so why I bring up that story is because I'm so proud that one, I was willing to not only bet on myself, but bet on my support team as well. Because the one thing I always say, and if anybody, you know, is listening right now, I would tell you, do not get hyped for the moment and then start to backpedal. She had an opportunity to make a dream a reality. And so I supported her in that, right? And that was a lot. Well, now fast forward, we have over 45 kids in that daycare. It's 7,500 square feet. And it's got a capacity for 87, right? And now we're going to ramp this up that probably Q1 will be closer to 70, 75. And now we're looking at a second building to open wow. up a center, right? Wow. That's, that's huge. And, but, but again, she comes from no entrepreneurial background, not wow. one. Her parents have worked jobs. Both of them have worked for over 35 years, all that. For her, she's been in the, the, the medical field and then she did title for a little bit. But again, that opportunity presented itself. And just like you said, it's, she could have talked herself out of it, but I didn't allow her to. And now I'm so proud of, of what, and I, and be honest, I'm just an investor in that business. Yeah. Like that's all been her. It, it, and it's been phenomenal to watch her as a woman go after her dreams. Right. And, and, and so I'm so, I'm, I'm so thankful that I got an opportunity to support her in this. Dope. Very cool. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that the, the, all those things. I think the the number one, the the willingness to 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 fail, right, and the willingness to understand that as long as I keep the right people around me, there's a there's a reason why some people are flourishing in social media and some people are not, right? But it's because they're too scared. As I grew my podcast, you're right, it, reaching out to people like Rashana, right, connecting with with so many dope people. I didn't really know if I had anything of value to give. I really didn't. Keep it one hundred. But I knew that I couldn't, I could not take the opportunity to, un, to, to one, showcase her talents, but to two, to see where the relationship goes. Right. If nothing would ever happen, then nothing would ever happen. But looking at the opportunity, what happens if this takes off? Yeah. Like that was, that's always been everything for me. Looking at the opportunity is, is the fun part. Yeah, so many gems there, like you said. Not only is the opportunity amazing, and that's what excites us, but let's not forget there is work in everything that we want to go after, right? So it's a matter of do you have the wherewithal to to start the work and carry out the work, right? Because you got to start, 
you got to keep going, you got to keep going, you got to keep going. And even, you know, it's funny because you mentioned my trip to Colorado. And I remember sitting and thinking about, for those who don't know, it was the women's real estate retreat that my friend and I hosted in Colorado. But a couple months prior, it was just a thought, right? It was just a thought. It was just an idea. And then we fast forward, had an amazing, I mean, life changing weekend, like, (laughs) One of the late ladies was crying. She didn't want to go home, you know? And just to see what you can create if you are crazy enough to believe that you can do it. And, you know, and to think that you can complete it successfully and whether or not it's successful or not, like you still go through and you complete it. Because I don't want to say here, I mean, we... you know, we live in a world of highlight reels, right? But it is not all highlights. <laughs> Life is not just about the highlights. So even if that's what people choose to showcase or display, you know, you can't fault them for that. Like, oh, this person only shows their highlights. Like, you can't fault anybody for that. You just have to keep in mind that you're running your own race and you're going to have those highlights ups and downs and those highs and those lows but as long as you keep going you're going to find that win you know you're well, going to get that win Absolutely. one of the one of the things you mentioned is that every dream has to be followed up with work and i think that the problem is and i've been reading the book black fortunes is they made us think that work is a bad thing when so much greatness comes from just doing the work and so they've convinced us to sit back and do nothing and wait and in doing that, we lose the connections, the resources, the, the skills, the knowledge, all that stuff that follows, and the money, the financial, the, the, that follows the work. And if we could just convince people to love the work and to enjoy the work and to embrace the work, we could see a lot of progress in a lot of areas. So work isn't the bad part. Right. Like not doing the work and having that idea and talking to yourself out of it and telling yourself that it's not going to succeed because of whatever, that's actually the L. The L is just not even attempting at all. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. And and I'll tell you, take it even a step further, because I think for a lot of us, we want to, so my thing with the Dream Nation, you know, and, and everything that, that I have based around that is my goal is to inspire other people to live a life by their design, right? And continue to dream in a world where we're taught to settle for what society tells us is reality. Right. And so, and so, and that's where I guess my saying goes, those of us who dare to dream while the rest of the world is settling for reality, we stand to change the world and make it a better place. And so I, I'm always looking at it and I say, here's a couple of different things. First off, loving the work. I'll be honest to tell you, I don't necessarily always love the work, right? A lot of us don't love the work, but you don't have to like, that's where like, I love, we all love Gary Vee to an extent, right? Gary Vee has become like a godfather, but at the same time, he talks about embracing and loving it. Like, no, if you look at the hardest workers in this world, they're not the wealthiest people. They do not have the most control over their time, right? You think of your grandpa, your uncle that's been working at Ford, whatever, they're the hardest workers but they're not the wealthiest and they don't have control over their time. So it's about understanding how to work smarter, not just harder, but more importantly, understanding what is your values? What are your principles, right? Like if the world understanding that death is coming for all of us, right? So if you had, if you knew that today or this week was your last week, how would you do it? Right. And leveraging it. I would argue to say that Jeff Bezos is not the hardest worker. Right. I even watched a video. This was what a couple months back and he was on stage and somebody asked him about decision making process and he was on stage and he said, you know, I think that so many high level executives do it wrong. He said, if you really look at it, you're paid as a high level executive to make one, maybe two decisions a day. The rest of it, your team should be doing right. You should have people in place that you should be able to leverage. That's, that's boring. He says that he don't, he don't do, if you go back and I'll find a video, I'll send it to you. I encourage anybody that's listening to to this point still, go look it up on YouTube. He says he will not take an intense conversation before 10 a.m. Now, granted, he's way above that now. Did he start off that way? It was probably a little bit different from when he started off. But understanding that we got to evolve, right? There's something that we say in real estate as an agent. If you don't have an assistant, you are the assistant. (laughs) <laughs> right you, you are the assistant so you have to figure out a way to put those people but to get back to the point i think that more importantly you got to understand why you're doing this 
That's the why. You got to have, you, I say all the time, you don't have to love the journey, but you have to be married to the destination. Mm -hmm. Put that out in the beginning. Start with the end in mind. If I know where I'm trying to get to, right, the journey might change. We, when, we, when we're on this path to get to Florida or wherever, sometimes we got to be in the fast lane on the left-hand side. Sometimes we're in the slow lane, right? Police behind us, things like that. It might change. The vehicle might catch a flat tire, right? right. We might have to, that vehicle might get shot. We got to get a rental car to get the rest of the way. But we still got to the destination. So right. as long as we know what our values are and what exactly do we want out of life at the end of the day, what right. exactly do we want on our tombstone, then, I mean, the work, it, it could change. Because Jeff mm-hmm. Bezos, he, he probably don't love the work. That's why yeah. he don't do none of the work. But he mm-hmm. still has the right people around him. And I think everybody has to look at what their strengths are. Some people are better behind the scenes, right? right. There's, there's some great people behind the scenes, and that's what really moves a business. But some people are not good behind the scenes. Like for me, I'll be honest, and I'm definitely, I'm definitely a doer rather than a teacher. And this is where I even called Roshana, I would say six months ago, right? And we were talking about what does that look like? And she's like, do you want to coach real estate agents? And I'm looking at it and people reach out to me and ask me these questions all the time. But for me, I don't know that I thrive in the teaching role, right? I could tell my story. I could tell how I do it. But I definitely, I take one of the, again, Jay Morrison, outwork the work. I'm definitely willing to outwork the work. But when it comes time for teaching people, so many people, I'm like, okay, let's go. And they're like, well, wait, I need, I need more questions answered. I'm like, <laughs> I'm out, right? And, and that's not good because you got to simplify it. And, and I say things and, and, you know, even my wife, she'll get on me and be like, yo, like you left out, you got somebody from A to, to M, but you left out D, E, F, G. And I'm like, well, how don't they know? You yeah. just you're ready, yeah. fire, aim. Yeah, Yeah. and I think, you know, I I think there's a fine line because so many people think that there's one path to, Mm -hmm. right, to the destination, Mm -hmm. Um, but you pointed out some really great points because, like you said, you don't necessarily have to love the work, but what are you doing in that waiting period, right? Are you getting involved with personal development are you educating yourself for where you want to go right like you might be flipping burgers at burger king but your dreams and your aspirations are to be whatever you know whatever it is you want to be right M- much mm-hmm. more than that but your current situation requires that you get up and you go flip these burgers regardless of how you're feeling today right mm-hmm. but what are you doing in the interim, right? Like, what are you doing? We all got the same 24 hours in a day. And what are you doing? And I think people, people, for whatever reason, they want to skip over the process and, you know, just get straight to the success. And yeah. it don't work that way. It doesn't work. That way. <laughs> it's definitely, somebody's got to do the work, right? And, and that's where it comes for you being a genius. And again, I, we always quote back the, these greats, but you know, when, when Jay, and I'm sure Charles Ty, you, you heard this when, when Jay was talking about, we're already born entrepreneurs, right? You don't have to have the credit. You don't have to, but you have to put a team of people around you and you know it working with private capital, right? If you're not the one out there hitting the hammer, you got to put somebody out there that's going to use the hammer. Right. And so that's what it is. And, and I heard something that was really great. And this came from um, my man, David Shands, right? Sleep is for suckers. But he had talked about, he said that he had learned if you, if you don't know how to build a team, that probably means that you need to go be on a team. Mm. Right? Right. For some people, if, you, if you're not, if instantly you can't build the team, you can't pitch the vision, you need to get behind somebody who else who's doing it. And then right. you build it up from there and eventually your time will come. Right. right. Yeah. And that's okay. That's okay. That's exactly what it is. It's, it's that balance. It's about understanding what your strengths are. Right. right? That's, that's, that's what it comes down to. And so I've been fortunate enough, again, to just try to surround myself with so many people that can always educate me. And, and, and more importantly, just understanding that if you don't bet on yourself, who, who else are you going to bet on? Right. Or who's going to bet on you? So I'm going to wrap it up. I'm going to ask you a few quick questions, quick in and outs. The first question is, who is somebody that you look up to and why? Yeah, there's a couple different people that come to my mind. First one I, w- I would say is Jay. Jay, and, and both of the Jays. But when I say about this, I'm talking about Jay-Z. Uh, yeah, because I, I kept, he was like, he went to a billion. I was like, I didn't know Jay Morrison was doing it like right, that, Right, 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 right. <laughs> so the first Jay that I was talking about was Jay-Z. When I say that I'm going to meet him in two years, and I said this on air so I could be held accountable. 
right? And and, and I know there's, there's ways around it of how you can do it. But Jay-Z, and the reason why is, again, because we saw his progression. We saw, so you, you don't, it's not walking by, in that sense, it's not walking by faith, but you actually get an opportunity to walk by sight. You can look back and see the videos that he did. You can see that he's made mistakes, not only in his personal life, but in business as well. Right. But he still keeps going and to see where his trajectory is now and how even when he talked after Nipsey had passed and he did that, you know, on stage and he was talking about I told that young brother, you know, uh, there's a million dollars. I can't remember the exact words, but he says there's a million on your payroll. Stay low. You know what I'm talking about? We did it. God, I'm going to have to send it to you guys. But yeah. it was right. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Gentrified it, on hood. Right. Yeah. 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 There's a hundred million dollars on your payroll. Stay low. And I just, Jay's, Jay's that guy for me. So he's, he's definitely inspired me to know that it doesn't matter from where I came from. It doesn't even matter to where I am today. It's where I tell myself that I'm going to go. And you know, like he says, man, there's so many things that I could quote from yeah. Jay. Uh, man, so he's even like the old school Jay-Z is just like, I, I forgot he was saying all that stuff. Like Jay-Z inspired a whole generation to go get it. We, we don't talk about that enough. 444 was huge. I know a lot of people love reasonable doubt and all of those, but I felt like 444 at the time of where it hit me, there's so many things in there with family feud and legacy and all these things that it was just yeah. like, that was, that was, that's going to always be on my heart. So I would say Jay-Z. Nice. What's your favorite business or real estate book? I say Rich Dad, Poor Dad, even though it's very cliche, but because it really did change my mindset on everything, right? Like I said, it taught me that I couldn't sell a car if I wasn't at the dealership. So it also taught me about understanding how to go from an employee mindset, even in the beginning, to being an investor. It, it taught me so many values that, that still stick with me to this day. And understanding that even network marketing and the different types of businesses that are out there are, are not bad. It's just about what your strengths are. So I would say it was Rich Dad, Poor Dad for me. What sets apart successful investors from those who give up, fail, or never get started? Yeah, I would say taking action, betting on themselves. Because a lot of the times I think about it and I always use my kids as a reference, right? How disappointed would I be if right now, if my, my daughter walks now, obviously she's two, but if she would have continued to just crawl because it was safe, right? How disappointed would us as parents be? We'd be very, we're like, wait, but there's a whole nother world out here once you can start to walk. Once you can start to run, when you can start to jump, and they're like, "Yeah, I get it, Dad, but this is I'm good right now." And so, <laughs> so that's what I would say. Taking because once you go through it, right? I've never. It's just like entrepreneurship. I've never met anybody that says, "Man, I want to go back and work for somebody else after they've started their own business," right? So that's yeah. what I would say. It's taking action. Most people they don't take action because of a fear, whether it's fear of failure, fear of their ego, pride, whatever. It's fear. So if you take action, you will be successful. And the last question is, what does wealth mean to you? Wealth means being able to create a life by my design. And so what do I mean by that? It means that, yes, you have to be able to save. You have to be able to give. But more importantly, you have to be able to empower. At the end of the day, here's, a, here's something that I'll leave you guys with. And, and this was a story that I heard about Warren Buffett. And this was when I first got into real estate in my first year. And he was on a panel with like Darren Hardy and some other big personal development people. But somebody asked Warren, hey, Warren, how do you know when you've truly been successful in life? And Warren said, and, and for people who know what everything that I've read, Warren Buffett's like an atheist. It, it, like, at least he doesn't talk about afterlife. He's all about the here and the now and be realistic. And so he said, you'll never know when you've truly been successful in life until you die, which I guess sparked like the room because people are like, oh my God, Warren talking about afterlife, what? And he's like, you'll never know until you die and you see how many people come to your funeral. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, you'll never know how successful you've been till you see how many of those people cry at your funeral, because those are the people who you've truly impacted their lives. Yeah. Yeah. So that was for me, I was like, oh my God, right? Like it's the, the money, all these things we can always buy and you know, house, car, whatever the money will come, especially if you're always open to the opportunities right? They're, when you're searching for the opportunities, in a sense, it's like the law of attraction. It's going to come to you, right? But how do you then leave those people to, if you left this, this earth today, Nipsey, you know, he, he was, regardless of where he was on that journey, he had already inspired and impacted so many people, 
right? And he was doing it in his own way. We all have our own way and we all have our own tribe or a congregation. It might not be across the internet where you got 60,000 people, but it might be in your church. It might be the school that you volunteer for every single year, right? It might be the flag football team that you, and, and if they can, if you can just inspire even just one person, right? But if you got bigger dreams, if you say, listen, I got a, I got a football team that could be like, man, I remember my coach. Because we all reflect no matter what age it is. We can all look back on it and say, boy, remember them 16-year-old days? Oh, I was crazy. But it's because somebody, some memory that we created, some experience that we created. So for me, it's all about the experience that I helped to create and the people that I helped to inspire to go after, you know, a life by their design, whatever that design looks like for them. Awesome, man. Super powerful hour and 15 minutes. Last kind of question, part of your remark is where can people find you? Where can they follow you? And where can they support what you have going on? Yeah, so great question. You can find me. I'm on all social media sites. I'm most active on Instagram and, and Facebook. I am also on Twitter and LinkedIn. I'm also on my website, castingoverbrooks.com. And to support me, for me, it's 2020. What it looks like for me is, is two things. One, speaking more all across the country and two, building uh, my real estate brand. So for anybody that's out there that has a real estate license and you're thinking about you want to either get in real estate or you want to level up, that's a huge opportunity that I've been blessed to come about. Yeah, that's, that's what it looks like for me. And hopefully, and anybody else that's listening, if you guys follow Miss Rashana Scott, like I know you do, make sure you put that bug in her ear that this opportunity, she needs to come partner up so we can blow it. <laughs> but that's all I'm going to say on that. I just had to put that out there. Otherwise, I would have had a little bit of regret in my heart. <laughs> <laughs> Dope. This is a great interview. Thank you so much for coming on. So many people, I'm sure, are going to walk away from listening to this being inspired. I'm inspired. I'm like, man, I need to set my search back up on the MLS because, you know, they expire after 120 days. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm like, I need to set my search back up and, you know, and get, get back to the grind. I mean, I'm always grinding, but, you know. Right. You but know. It's, again, it's about, you know, living a life by your design, making sure that, that these experiences that you have created, right, that, that you're still, you're putting it on for other women, right, and, and us really understanding at the end of the day, our stories are not for us, right? Yeah. Our stories are for other people. And so you've already impacted so many lives. Same thing, Charles, you've already impacted so many lives. So keep doing what you guys are doing. And, and I'm blessed to be able to be on here. And hopefully somebody takes at least one nugget away because that means all of our times was, was well worth it. Absolutely. Yeah. And on that note, let the church say amen. amen. <laughs> so for uh, episode 100. What's up? I was going to say episode 130, Charles Ogilvy, Rashana Scott, Casanova Brooks, signing off. Signing off. Hey guys, thank you for sticking with me and watching this video. Now, if you've gotten any value out of this video, I want you to do me a favor. I need you to make sure that you hit that subscribe button and also turn on those bell notifications. What that's gonna do is it's gonna tell you whenever I drop more heat just like this video. And make sure that you hit that like button because that's gonna let the YouTube gods know that more people need to be seeing this video. I appreciate you watching and as a token of my appreciation, I dropped a couple couple more videos for you to take a look at in the meantime until I drop more heat. Remember, in the dream we trust, but you got to take action. Otherwise, that dream that you have will only merely be a fantasy. I'll catch you on the next one.